Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us for our uh, last uh, session for the Americas and last session for, for the whole workshop. Um, so as you may know, today we'll be discussing uh, the application, different application of anti-covariance uh, towers. We will be hearing from uh, three speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Hausenschuf, we have Dr. Enrico Yepes, and Dr. Stefan Metzger. So as you also already know, we're going to have like around 20 minutes for each presentation, followed by question. And uh, also, if you would like after the session to ask questions, just drop them in the Slack and we'll try to make sure that they're, they're answered. So without further ado, uh, we will start with Dr. Hausen Chu from Ameriflux, and he'll be discussing Ameriflux in a nutshell and AMP Ameriflux management project. So, yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, can hear you. And see my screen. Yeah, we're seeing the uh, not the full screen. We're seeing the slide. Let me bring it on. Okay. Right. How's everything looking? Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here to talk to you. Um, so I I was tasked with a very complex uh, topic to talk about, and I'll try my best uh, to cover it. Uh, starting with Ameriflux, uh, just Ameriflux in a nutshell, just for uh, a lot of different aspects of the Ameriflux, I try to put my understanding and try to introduce you. Um, maybe you know some of those already. Maybe you are uh, familiar with certain part of the Ameriflux um, uh, activity already, but I uh, just keep uh, stay with me and we can talk about some of the detail. And uh, as the presentation move on, I think Stefan will be the last one so he can talk more about the uh, modeling and some other application down the road, but just give you an idea. So I'm currently a research scientist at the Ber uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab and um, mostly work on our Ameriflux management project. I'll talk a little bit in the second part of their presentation. So um, uh, I just try to put it, my head around about, uh, give some idea about what is Ameriflux. I mean, if you talk to different people, you might give different answer and you might heard about Ameriflux a lot and you're different in a different context. So I try to, uh, put mine here to share with you and uh, give you some idea what I think about Ameriflux. I mean, first of all, Ameriflux, I think, is a network of the uh, Eddie Covenant Tower site station. So we're talking. So this is kind of the map uh, uh, most updated today about the register site across Ameriflux. So uh, North, South America, and uh, all the dot here is the location of the site. Um, some are active one, some are historical one. Not all of them are running currently, but just these are the site we know. And the circle uh, represent the uh, data record we have in our database, right? So the larger the cycle, the longer the data record we have. And some of them just registered their site. So triangle means their uh, registered site haven't submitted or working on the way to get the data in. At the moment. So look at the picture here. This is uh, something I really like to share a lot of time, just uh, how diverse and also beautiful on the site because a different ecosystem, different tower structure um, operated by different teams. We'll talk about that later. And today we know there are more than 600 sites across America. I think there are more out there um, coming, coming out soon. Uh, about 450 of them, we have data, some sort of data available right now. So it's a huge uh, collection of the tower site uh, for people doing uh, flux research across America. So if you're thinking about not just a geographic view, but also putting the like a climate uh, uh, climate eco, eco region uh, point of view, think about all these site location. There has been a lot of discussion about how well we represent or cover different, different ecosystems, different climate and zone across the, the, let's say, North and South America. How good we are doing that. So this is one way to, to think about this. So on the left-hand side, this is a, a typical climate space. Uh, the preset is the mean temperature for each of the pixels across the, uh, North and South America. That's a backdrop. 
and you can color them by a different eco region, right? So starting from the North uh, Arctic Tundra all the way to South Patagonia, and they are different. They, they kind of have a different uh, temperature preset pattern, right? a different climate space. And all the dots here, including a black one, uh, the circle one, or the, uh, the, I mean, the cross one here represent the site we know have data, and some of them running for a long time. How well we actually cover this climate space? And on the right hand side is kind of a breakdown. So if you break each of the eco region down, and how well each of the eco region have some site cover in those space. So you can say we are doing a pretty um, good job in most of the eco region, right? So if you look at most of the North America, you have a lot of site cover in those area already. And uh, data availability might be another question, um, whether there's some editing or they're still working on. South America is, is doing better, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement, especially if you look at the down, the Andes, um, the Patagonia region, um, I think there are more room to improve in the future. If you're looking at the, uh, we, we talk about eco-region, so this is a larger scale uh, um, level, but if you narrow down, zoom into a, a site-specific, uh, IGBP, this is ecosystem type, plant functional type, and how well we represent we, we uh, different uh, plant functional type within the network, right? So again, left-hand side, this is kind of everything across North and South America, and how well we all tower uh, cover those uh, different uh, IGBP type across the region. Right-hand side is a breakdown, right? So for most of the ecosystem type, you can see that there are, there are a decent number of the tower available somewhere and measuring across the, uh, the gradient temperature preset, there are some room for improvement, but for sure. I think we have a, a much better coverage right now than 10, 20 years ago, and we're dealing with a, a larger scale problem. Another interesting aspect uh, I want to mention about Merflux uh, compared to other uh, networks, when Stefan might be talking about NEON, or some people might know about LTR, CZO, LTL, some other context, is Merflux is kind of the bottom of uh, work, right? So a lot of people from different research institutions, they get funding from different funding resources, then they build their tower um, in their way and process the data. And later, and all these people then come together, join, volunteer, and share as a network. So this is kind of bottom up effort. But also I mean this is not a top-down approach. So we don't dedicate where the tower should be. So on the right hand side, because of this organic nature, you can see the Merflux is pretty clustered. Uh, that means a lot of people, they're setting up a couple of towers in a small region, and they have shared similar climate uh, condition, and maybe different, uh, they are different in terms of their uh, land cover, land use type. Maybe they, are chain, they have a different uh, current sequence uh, stage, uh, forest, harvest, wildfire disturbance and how many years they recover after the wildfire. So they have a, a different site cover different this different stage or maybe different management, disturbance, restoration. So if you look at the, this map here, sorry for the messy, but just want to show you idea of the cluster, right? So each of the region, you have a, some sort of a, a several tower near each other and they, have a very similar climate condition, but they may vary in terms of their, uh, a lot of things. And this could be a very interesting data set to test, right? So if you're a model, or if you try to do something, uh, look at the how forest um, uh, cooling or, or warming compared to the uh, nearby open field, you may be able to find something like this in Merflux. If you look carefully, there are certain sites nearby with a different link up to it. So moving on, Merflux is not just a collection of size, but most important is a collection of the flux data, right? That's what we care about. And today we're talking about um, more than 3,000 site year of data from 450 sites. So that's a huge data set we're talking about in data risk, actually. If you look at this, this is kind of the data availability by year. And forget about the, the color for now, just look at the, the total, total um, uh, the size of the ball. This will give you an idea. I mean, from uh, early 90 all the way to 2000, that's a lot of increase in terms of the site becomes available, being built up and share the data. And um, reaching a certain point about more than 100 sites uh, operating concurrently, actually. And then in the last couple of years, we also see an increase of the site, uh, NEON and some other uh, LTL 
have been started operating and join also join the Ameriflux share their data. So we see a lot of increase in terms of this side. So at, at even each even year, we're thinking we're talking about roughly 150 sites operating concurrently sharing their data. Another thing I want to point out is in the earlier day, right? If you look at the gray one, this is kind of a data availability back in 2013, right? So you have some data and it took a couple of years for data become available. So maybe four or five years become available. But if you look at the blue one, the darkest one, this is a data availability become available in last year, in 2022. So not just more data, more site, but also a more a frequent update of the data, right? By the end of the 2022, we're seeing roughly almost 90 sites have some sort of 2022 data available in our data set. So that means people are turning their data more frequently in a, in a real time, in a semi real time way to share their data. Uh, another thing to look into the Merifax data, um, if you look at just a variable here and how uh, variable coverage across a site, this is kind of the idea about how many sites have each of the variable here across the data set. And as I said earlier, Ameriflex is pretty organic. So that means everyone got to choose which variable, which instrumentation uh, they're going to collect at the site. How many of this actually collect at the site? There are some core measurement um, might be shared among most of the site, right? You see flux, this is typical for, for all of the site. They have some flux measurement. There are some radiation measurement here, long way, show way, maybe palm. Uh, some soil measurement, temperature, humidity, some measurement, but there are a, a lot of variety depend driven by the research needs. So people might have a very unique set of the instrumentation or variable collected at the site. Another thing to think about here is the color here. And right? so a lot of variable they have a replicate, maybe a multiple location, either a special variation or vertical variation here at the site. So there are multiple. Um, the multiple sensor variable being collected at the site and something to think about it. Another thing I want to highlight about the data is we're dealing with, we're dealing with a rich uh, temporal data set. I mean, really, really rich. I mean, um, at this time, I think there are more than 100 sites. They have uh, more than 10 years of data record, and that's a huge data set. Now look at the figure on the right-hand side. This is kind of a time series of the different fluxes. From, from uh, a couple selected long-term site, we know a uh, long operation site, we know on Mariflux, right? So you saw the Harbor Forest here, uh, HA1, uh, Park 4, this is in, in Wisconsin, Holland in uh, Maine. I think this is can, a Canadian site, Bowden. Uh, Mayberry is one of the longest uh, mapping fluxes site. And it's Already you have all the data been collected for 20, 30 years already. And this is a rich temporal information thing. On the left hand side, this is kind of give you an idea about this is kind of this is a web-led composition. So you see the, the temporal signature of all this time series from each individual side. All the gray line here from one individual side, right? Some are longer, some are shorter. And uh, all of them have some signature in the different scale, right? So you see here the subdated daily scale, there are some dynamic cycle very strong here. Now, the higher the number means the, the higher variability at this scale. And we know for uh, phonology or some other thing uh, driving the seasonality. So there's strong uh, signal also in the uh, seasonal and annual cycle. But because we are getting a longer, longer, much longer data set, so a lot of very interesting scientific questions can be asked. We were targeting some other skill, like a decade Can we see anything like that? And I think we're reaching the point we can start to tackling those questions and start answering some of those questions. So a lot of data um, being used, a lot of data being downloaded. Um, this is a statistic we know from the last, I think, five to 10 years, so uh, roughly more than uh, 31,000 download for a Fox data set. We know uh, there are more than 5,000 users across the globe. And uh, a lot of data use, I, I don't have time to cover all of that, uh, but just give you some idea, right? So earlier day, uh, I think a lot of synthesis uh, formed because of the, this call 
as cooperation of the Amerifax network or some other regional network. It starts with the synthesis. So everyone operating one or two sites and they want to share the data, data to see if they can come up with a, a, a general pattern, a gradient, something like that. And later it becomes a, a FluxNet tower site becomes an important benchmarking validation for a lot of remote sensing, right? Like MODIS in the earlier day, and now there are much more other products become available, eco stress and Sentinel or some other thing become available, but there's a lot of synergy activity between the uh, flux tower and also remote sensing community. Uh, land model, earth system model is another big topic, um, whether um, for a lot of model out there, um, the uh, flux net data, AmeriFlux data essentially is a, a golden standard for benchmarking, maybe to validate their model production uh, prediction in a way. And um, um, some other other active across here mentioned education, some other activity. I'm just showing out just a couple of papers. I'm not going to detail, but if you Google just a little bit, this is come out, a couple of paper come out just very recently in the last couple of months, essentially, how they're using uh, Ameriflux data in a different application, different field. Okay. Um, before I move on to the second part of the management project, I want to mention, especially for the uh, 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 early career scientists here is uh, I think uh, another important aspect of our method is that it's a it's a community of a flux researcher. So it's not just data, not just station, uh, not just hardware. But also important is the people behind this, right? So there are a lot of research going in the tower side. It's a very open community, and um, and you can learn a lot. And also um, if you have a work, uh, a chance to work with some of them, either through a working group or maybe at some of the side using their data, it's a great opportunity and also a great avenue to learn and join the community and and, and learn something from this and doing something good too. Okay. So moving on, shifting gear a little bit, just uh, give you a very general uh, introduction about Merifax. Let's talk about the project, um, especially in the last couple of year, uh, 10 years, uh, more than 10 years already supporting all this activity. So this is an Amerifax management project. Uh, this is a project funded by DOE uh, since uh, 2012. Um, uh, most of our uh, team is based in uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab. Uh, the goal, ultimate goal for the project is to ensure quality, but also availability of the continuous long-term ecosystem management and to support um, the other, other modeling effort or synthesis effort. So to support this, we kind of target a couple of things, right? So we form a team, uh, photos here, uh, also my uh, great um, group member. Um, a couple of things we're targeting, I'm going to int introduce them briefly, next couple of slides. So we, uh, we know that technical support is very important to ensure the quality of data. So we have a, a technical team and then data support for sure, because that's how we, everyone do science, they share data. So how can we enable that? Um, but also on Merifax project, we also sponsor directly uh, core site. I'll talk that later in a few slides and then outreach. And uh, let's start with core site. Um, we mentioned about NIA and some other network. So they have a dedicated, uh, resources and uh, build a tower and uh, central processing and a lot of support. Uh, something unique about Mariflux is we don't, we do, we have a core site uh, concept here. So we directly sponsor some of the site. But the difference here is most of the tower we don't, we don't build that uh, during the project period. Right? So a lot of them, they, they may be running already 10 years or 20 years already. So we kind of just providing support. So you can see the picture here, all the tower look very different and um, operating by different group across America. So some of them, those, this course I've been selected just to re represent some of the uh, uh, ecosystem type across the, uh, across the United States, but also um, uh, to provide long-term data sets. So a lot of them been operating for long-term, like 20 to 30 years. Uh, another important aspect is the core side PI, uh, who, uh, who is a person and leading the team to run the tower side. So they're based in different university or um, uh, government agency or different lab across the state, like here. Uh, another important aspect is a lot of this core side PI, they are the backbone, um, important key person uh, help 
developing a lot of uh, activity with we'll, we'll talk later right so leading a, uh maybe in a, uh, being the committee of the annual meeting or maybe leading certain uh, working group or certain uh, synthesis activity so it's very important to connect to some of the people and work together so this is a core side Another important about community activity, right? A couple of things just briefly mentioned, right? So webinar, uh, what we learned in the last couple of years, just doing a lot of webinar and uh, YouTube channel, <laughs> or something like this we're doing today. Um, workshop, um, there are a couple of workshops we held, or maybe a sponsor or provide support uh, this year already. Uh, the real one is uh, a mini workshop, one and a half day. This will be local, um, a mini workshop we start to start doing this year so this will be in Madison if you're in the region and you happen to want to know to connect some of people this could be a good opportunity for you uh, if you can travel to there this is one and a half day um, it's free of registration uh, you just have to cover your travel another coming uh, another event coming up is an annual meeting we we typically typically hold every year um, this is a good avenue for people to share their science and also meet each other and education and talking about a great idea. Uh, this year will be in, uh, in Harbor Forest or somewhere uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. I think the abstract uh, is closed, but uh, the registration should be still open. So if you have a chance to come, uh, please, this is a great opportunity to connect to other people. Uh, let's talk about data. Um, so it's on chat. Yeah, thank you. Annual meetings open. Uh, let's talk about data. Um, this is a, one of the important part of the Merfax project. Uh, is we um, work with our international um, collaborator to build up a standard. And so when you using the data from Merfax or ICOS or some other network, you know, you pretty much um, they have a very similar standard. Uh, the same variable name, the same unit, the same type, um, even um, to a certain point in the process or a quality control in the same way. So you know you can uh, all use all this data together. And this is an important part of our data activity. Uh, we also do a, a, a secondary quality control uh, for all the data coming. Um, and it's the data we talk about it. Um, then every site got a DOI on this, uh, you know, with a credit and uh, acknowledgement information. When people use the data, they can have a, uh, a good way to give the credit. Uh, another important part is the FluxNet data set. Uh, if you ever use the FluxNet data, the previous version is FluxNet 2015. Uh, it's a joint effort between Flux and ICOS. And now we are trying to updating those data. So the idea is we'll be generating regularly some of the so-called FluxNet product. And uh, ICOS will be doing the same thing, and we are doing the same thing. So this will become a regular basis. We are not doing a big release. We are doing a monthly, quarterly release. Uh, how depends on how many sites we can process at each quarter at our um, uh, effort. Uh, at this point, I think we have a, a more than 100 sites in Mariflux. They have so-called FluxNet product available. So some of them been updated to the latest couple of years, 2020, 2021. So if you're looking for FluxNet product, uh, this could be a way to go. And you can combine this with uh, whatever you get from ICO, so some of the regional network. It will be compatible to a previous FluxNet 2015. Okay. All right, this is just a pipeline I'm talking. So uh, if you're new to Ameriflux, this is kind of unique, right? So each individual site that collect their data and they prepare the data in a standard way, submit to uh, um, the team here. And we do a sort of thing like quality control and make a release. So this is what we call base, maybe just uh, some people call level two if you know the data for a long time. This will be combined with metadata and make available. Then we do further one flux processing. So there, this will be a flux net product just mentioned already. Okay, a uh, few more things about my flux data support is uh, we, we, we build a website and a lot of user interface there uh, for you to use the data if you're a um, data user, right? You can do site search and some, um, a lot of things I mentioned, repeat, just go, go to a website and play a little bit. Uh, one thing we are working on right now is uh, previously we have a, 
like a size cutout for all the models and some other remote sensing product uh, collaboration with Oak Ridge. And now we're working with the Phenocam team, try to bring the Phenocam image and maybe some of the data to a site page, right? So a lot of AmeriPlug site, they have a Phenocam uh, co-located in the tower. And this is, could be a very important information when you use the data. And we try to bring this data to a site page. So when you go to a site, you know, yeah, there's a web, uh, there's a link to your Phenocam and there's some image about the site, you can know about the condition of the site and potentially getting the data. Another important thing we've been working on in the last couple of years is try to in, um, 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 and working with the people to to uh, adapting to a new open policy, data policy I mentioned here. This is uh, CC by four is a more open policy. It's becoming uh, more adopted by many um, uh, either funding agency required by a funding agency, maybe some journal require you to have a more open uh, data policy. And Ameriflux is adopting this idea. At a point, I think that 75% of our data holding are there in so-called CC by four. That means uh, if you ever use Ameriflux data, that means it, you can go uh, and just download data, use data, and just give a credit to data. You don't have to go through the previous process about sending more email to the uh, AVPI about co-authorship and the process. I mean, you still can, uh, just depends on the nature of your study. You can, now you can have a open policy as, a, as an option. And this uh, open policy applies to all the FluxNet product I just mentioned earlier. So all FluxNet will be in open policy. Last uh, is uh, if you are a user, you prefer to have a, um, you don't like a user interface or you, maybe you're dealing with a larger data set, you want to have a way to, um, to query, searching and also downloading your data in a programmatic way. Um, there's a package, R package being put together um, Late uh, early last year is available if you want to um, explore that option. Um, just I have only one, maybe a few slides left. Um, quickly mention tech support. Um, just uh, we'll put, if you are if you are a member of the site, running your site, maintaining your site, uh, we do provide some of the longer program uh, calibration gas, uh, dew point generator for long, and some of this can be utilized if you have a uh, um, if you need that. Um, and last down the bottom is the site visit. This is what we did for tech team. Uh, in the past, we do a, a what call um, comprehensive site visit, right? So we bring a, a portable system to a site. We do a comparison for a week or two weeks and do a benchmarking compare between the system and see how, how well they are. Because the Mavrox is pretty organic. Everyone has a different system, different processing. So this is a way uh, we try to ensure and get an idea about how comparable our data are. And this is great, um, but as I mentioned earlier, we are having a lot of, lot of site right now uh, compared to 10, 20 years ago. So it becomes infeasible to try to visit uh, every site um, in the foreseeable future. But I think about if you have a 200 site that are active, how often can you visit a site, right? We can do eight to 10 per year maximum. And that means maybe 20, 20 years later, we'll be able to come back to a site and to visit so it becomes um, challenging about doing this. Uh, by the way, this is a photo uh, just uh, a few days ago. We are, we are doing a site visit essentially in Kansas, one of the Neon Tower in Kansas. And it just it went successfully. We just took that system and ready to get go on. But anyway, so this is one way, but we are um, ex exploring some other option. Can we do a hybrid mode, right? So some side might, we can just do a, a remote connection. We can look at their data and they're processing and have a way to suggest maybe uh, provide our uh, best practice to the site. And some, some site might need a comprehensive uh, comparison, bring our tower, uh, bring our system to there and do the comparison. And also we are exploring the idea I mentioned earlier about a mini workshop is uh, since we're there for uh, one or two weeks, can we just, uh, um, I don't know, connect to other people in the region, um, if, um, maybe student or some other technician or a new site, new member to the Netflix, then maybe you can have a mini workshop, share the experience, share the idea, and build some uh, potential cooperation or synthesis effort on that. So this is kind of a new idea, how we try to reach more and more people. Uh, last thing is, um, uh, this is kind of, uh, uh, we call thing year. This is kind of a bring everything together. 
Um, let's focus on one topic for two years. And uh, it's a great idea and it's generating a lot of interest and also outcome. Um, so we have a year of methane a couple of years ago, year of water fluxes, and we're in the year of remote sensing right now. So a lot of activity, webinar, working group, um, um, maybe a workshop, uh, maybe a special issue call, something like that. And we're also exploring any uh, dedicated data and tech support to sponsor, to dedicate to this uh, thing here. So um, this is my last slide, I think I'm a little bit over time. Just in case um, I try my best to cover all aspects of flux in the project, but if you have any question or uh, any interest, please feel free to reach out. I'll stay on the Slack channel, but you can, you can email me directly if you want. And thank you again. I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hassan, for, for your presentation. Um, so if you have a question for Hassan, you can like ask them now or just drop them in the chat. Uh, I have like one question. So for the workshop that, that you're gonna have them like this summer, so are they like data processing or like setting up a tower, like what are like their focus? I mean, they have a specific focus or it's general? Yeah, you mean the, the mini workshop in mm -hmm. uh, Madison? Yes. Well, since this is a mini workshop, I think there are maybe 20 attendants. So we kind of sending out email a survey actually. So gathering people's interest. So it depends on who, what people want to talk about. Then we talk about that. So I think one day we have a one day indoor. I think there are four, roughly four sections. The first one is about uh, just a brief intro of the Merfax, uh, um, all the service we provided and how to get there. The second one will be uh, everyone because I think there are maybe 10 and maybe 12 teams coming from different sites, different institutions. So they're going to share what they do at their site and maybe a little bit about how they, uh, what can they share with each other. And we have another one is about the technical support. A lot of people have interest about calibration, so we're going to focus on that best practice. Another one, uh, last one will be just data focus. Uh, I think people have interest about um, how to prepare the data for main approximation. It's one, another one will be something like a QQC review process. So it's a little bit small group and also it's customized or maybe um, depends on what people's interest. And that's the first, this is the first mini workshop we're going to have uh, this year. So well, welcome to ID. If you want to come, you can you can come and deal sign up for, to be there. So if you want to oh, join. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Hosan, it was really, really nice overview presentation. I really enjoyed listening to it. I have one question about, um, like, actually two questions. One about the data use policy that you mentioned. Um, so could you just elaborate a little bit more about it? Because um, so when we are, so as a model, if I use the um, data set, can I just um, cite the DOI? of the data set or do I have, so I don't need to contact each co-author for um, using the data set? Or, and the second question is about the data QA, QC, because you mentioned that there are a lot of sites and in this Ameriflux network and each of them probably, do they have like a unified QA, QC processes or um, is there like a guideline for this QA, QC? Um, yeah, so these are my two questions. Yeah, thank you for the great question. The first one will be, um, I mentioned, depends on the, if you if you download a site or maybe you go to a site page and you would know uh, the what policy this, this site's data would be, right? And 75% of them, if you're using a base, uh, the level two data, 75% of them, they're open. So if you're using all site from open policy, yes, uh, go to the data policy website, but I think uh, in a simple way will be yes, you can just go ahead and use the data, cite the DOI, provide a proper uh, credit in your uh, research. You don't have to contact each PI. You don't have to. Uh, you could, but you don't have to. But it's a good idea to contact PI if you need additional information, just confirmation about the site. Uh, all FluxNet data are in open policy, so you can, yeah, similar to this. There are roughly 25% of them are still in legacy. I mean, the base 
data products. So if you use those, um, yes, the data guideline is you have to contact the PI and just follow the preview process. But yeah, so this is the idea. The second part of the quality control, we, yes, Ameriflux is processed and quality controlled by each of the indi individual sites. So yeah, there's some, there's some heterogeneity or difference there uh, for sure. That's why we're doing site visit, te uh, technical visit, and we do have a, a, a QQC in our pipeline. So when people submit data, we do a kind of a, a, a little bit harmonized quality control across all the submissions. So they kind of meet a, a similar standard of the quality standard when they are released, but there's still some variability. I cannot, yeah, we cannot just promise they are all the same. So that's it's kind of the legacy and also the history of the Airflux. Just be aware when you use the data. So yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hassan, for for the presentation. Sure. Um, I think yeah. Now we move to our second uh, talk today by Dr. Uh, Enrico Yepes from Instituto Tecnologico de Sonora. Uh, Dr. Yepes will be presenting about connecting the dots for constructing a flux network uh, to understand the function of Mexican ecosystem. So, yes, hello. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you hear me well? Actually, we can hear you, but uh, I, yeah, we can hear you. You're okay. connecting from another device, right, to the voice. Yes, yes, that's okay. Correct. Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Now, let me see if I can share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Is it like like? No, we're seeing show? the PowerPoint, not the not the yeah. Now we're seeing the full full PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. excellent. Well, thank you very much for the invitation for this ACN group for FluxNet. It's really an honor to talk to you. It's one of my favorite part of my job is talking to the young generations. I think it's been the the way a network can be really constructed is what really consolidates the the second and third generations are the ones that are really doing the work and putting the pieces all together so this is this is great that i get to speak to this type of audience so what i'm gonna try to do as Hausen was saying is was a challenging theme that you guys gave us for for today's topic so i'm gonna try to do my best just some recollection of how we how we put metrics together and then some challenges that we've seen on trying to model the processes or the function of our ecosystems here in, here in Mexico. So just some context, of course, uh, as you see in the invitation, I'm, I live and work here in Mexico, which is a large country. It's about 2,000 square kilometers of land. Uh, we have a population of about 130 million. It's a very diverse country, so we have a very complex terrain, orography. We have two sierras on the east and the west side and a, and a volcanic belt in the center of the country that somewhat cuts the, the arid and the, and the more subtropical part of the, of the country. We have extensive coastal areas in the Atlantic and the Pacific. We have this Gulf of Mexico, which has some unique uh, processes and which actually affect strongly the land processes. We have the Gulf of California, which is a small gulf, but it's also very unique on the way the ocean is actually interacting with the land in there. For example, how it interacts with the monsoon season in the summer, which brings the, the seasonal rains to this part of the of, of the northwestern part of, of Mexico, for example. And one thing that is really unique is that we see the northernmost limit of ecosystems that are important, sort of like mangrove systems, which are now very hot topics. You know, the blue carbon issues that we've been discussed widely by the scientific community as, and with the flux community, of course. And uh, ecosystems like the tropical dry forest that also gets its, its most uh, northern distribution here in, here in Mexico. As you can see in the slide in the center, it's a very seasonal country. The slide on the top is the, is the spring. It's a dry spring. We basically, most of the country, as you can see, is dry during the, the winter spring. And then the summer fall is when we have our rains, most of the rains across the country. And it's when the, the country really gets most of the carbon fluxes and dynamics pretty much across the, the country. 
uh, our our ecosystems are classified in 51 vegetation classes and perhaps 24 ecoregions, similar to what Hausen was showing for the Ameriflux domain. So this is sort of like the context of where we're we're working. Uh, this slide basically points out that we have an important uh, provide we're important providers for goods for the world like tequila, food, meat. Avocados, you know, so this is important. It brings a strong revenues to our to our economy, but it also puts a lot of pressure in our ecosystems. As you might imagine, these crops so use the most fertile soils that we can access to. Those are often in where nice ecosystems were, like uh, tropical dry forest or moist forest, um, or even temperate forest in the center part of the of the country, so that basically bring uh, configures our landscapes as a mosaic of successional sites, starting from agro lands to abandoned lands, and then secondary forest, and then patches of mature forest, and you see across ecosystem and across and across the country. Unfortunately, there is poor information about activity data. Of course, with the advent of satellite information, it's it's a lot more information but it's not appropriately validated in the ground. So we know that it's patchy. We know that there are several uh, successional stages across the country, but we can see them from the satellites. We get in and get in more and more information, but still a lot to do in the in the ground to validate. And of course, the, the flux part is still to be um, centered in this type of dynamics. Uh, we have beautiful ecosystems as part of the motivation, I think, that brings uh, lots of food community to work in, in our Mexican ecosystems. They're even the driest, the driest ecosystems are quite diverse. So this brings uh, uh, an important complexity, but it also attaches you uh, some to the, to the ecosystem that you work on. Uh, these this ecosystems, and I think it's something that nice that has happened here in, in Mexico, is that we are uh, measuring, we're putting our flux towers not close to where we work, I think. We actually drive a few hours, some of us. My closest sites are three hours away from my office and rugged terrains. So we get, we have been lucky to reach uh, important ecosystems on their, on their actual setups, um, backing up in the Sierras, for example. And that's, uh, that's I think, an important contribution to understand complex ecosystems. So just to, to talk about a little bit of our network, uh, I concisely with, with Hausen, since 1991, there have been some sensitivity from the, that generation where the fluxes were start to measure. You know, late in the 90s, the first tower sites were deployed in Mexico. They were mostly focused on water fluxes. You know, Mexico has, has a tradition that the flux community in general has a lot of interest in the water fluxes. You know, before we talked about carbon, we were very, very interested on in understanding about water fluxes, and that's easy to understand because we're in a highly seasonal ecosystem. As I was mentioning, half of the year is dry across the country mostly, and then the second part of the of the country when it's wet is when the uh, ecosystem get active and the Gas exchanges, of course, and and then so, but it was this 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 uh, 2011 when we have finally some seed money from our main funding agency, the Conasid, the equivalent to NSF in the U.S., to have some seed money to start gathering people to talk about you know fluxes and eddy covariance and how we can sense the function of our ecosystem. So with Rodrigo Vargas back in those days. We have this seed money when we were lucky to gather people. And from there, we start having chats and like knowing each other, really, finding where the towers were, where the sites were. Then in 2017, we have an important meeting when we started doing commit commitments on sharing data among ourselves and then opening our databases to the community. This is where we've been starting to take the, the invitation from Ameriflux more seriously, uploaded some sites to the uh, many flood databases in that part this these this years uh, working with the programa mexicano del carbono has been very fundamental because this is the sort of like the equivalent to the nacp in the us so with this community 
that talks about biosciences, carbon cycle, sustainability, and ecosystem processes, both in the ocean and in the land. It's been very important to, to consolidate interactions with the previous generations and the newer generations that are dealing with fluxes. And from then, basically in the, in the latest years, this the new was the latest generation of scientists that are dealing with eco, eco variants, models, ecosystem processes are basically taking the lead on, on, on keeping up with the with the activities of our networks. So, but I wanted to talk about this, how to connect those dots, basically some of the story of how connecting those dots back in 2011. This is the map that Rodrigo and I came up with. Uh, we didn't know much about those, those sites, I guess, but well, we knew some about the Norton sites because Rodrigo worked in Ensenada and I got my start working in Sonora. But we have little information about what was going on in the rest of the country. Those early workshops were very important to know the people, to know the ecosystem, and to know how uh, eddy coherence was actually being used to, to study ecosystem processes. So, and the, that effort to connect the dots. So, what we had to do first was to find the pioneers, basically, start talking to them. We call them the mafia here. But I wasn't sure to put that on the slides, but we call them the pioneers. So the first step was to talk to them, you know, uh, basically gain their trust, you know, taking, t telling them that our proposal was serious, that we wanted to network, to learn more about our ecosystems, about more about the processes, put the context of climate change in front, sustainability, and et cetera. It was very interesting because to gain the trust of these um, colleagues, we had to come from different uh, disciplines. The, basically, in Mexico, the flux, the flux measurements were started, as I was saying, uh, by the hydrologist community. They were very interested in ET measurements. You know, the, early in the 90s, getting good measurements of reality was um, a conundrum. That's when the technology really developed and and uh, good measurements of about transportation were available and they were starting to spread out. The technology was somewhat cheaper. It was easier to measure just water than actually measure water and carbon. But there were people like Alejandro Castellanos or Stephen Bullock that were actually ecologists. They're like ecologists, hardcore ecologists that were very interested in function, functional processes. And then basically communicating the hydrology community with the ecological community was a very far uh, initial step that was very important to to construct. It, it's been through, I mean, a decade later, seeing how hydrologists are very sensitive to vegetation processes and to carbon fluxes actually, and how ecologists have now have to deal with atmospheric processes of geochemistry and that kind of stuff. It's been very interesting to see how the merge of from either side. Had occur, and I think Eddie Covariants offered that that merging and offered that uh, that possibility to talk to these uh, different disciplines that was not common to do here in Mexico. So through this decade, I think this was being very important. So I guess we eventually gained the trust. We started networking. You know, we started sharing our data among us here in Mexico. So I was saying the Programa Mexicano de Carbono was fundamental for that. We started committing. We finally uploaded some data and then as I was saying, uh, John very impetuous committee is now taking the lead for the for the network and basically it's a very tight uh, tight community that beyond the network, you no, know, the very good friendship have brought and and we have now the ambitious agendas to for the for the next decade, I guess, to, to work on this type of of work. So now this is how much looks it is right now. We have only two 12, only 12 sites active. We still have this bias in in the northern part of the country. That's somewhat what the network originated and where some of us live. Uh, what is interesting is that even if it's in the northern part, as I was saying, we're investigating ecosystems that are in the northernmost limit, like mangroves and tropical dry forest. Uh, the, we, I guess, coincidentally, the coastal influences to these ecosystems, as you can see across the, the map, is important. This is a feature that we are starting to put in context. 
uh, because most of the ecosystems are near the near the coast, not necessarily, not necessarily coastal ecosystems, but are somewhat influenced by the by the coast. For example, the contrast of Chamela, which is in Jalisco, this uh, Max Cha, is a tropical dry forest, but is highly influenced by coastal uh, air masses. In, in and it's an important contrast to the tropical dry forest that is somewhat in the other side of the Gulf of California, for example. So same type of ecosystems with very different contrast in their in, in their atmospheric drivers at least. So so that's the so far the network and how we, we try to, to build it. I think we've been somewhat successful and we have a very ambitious goal for the next for the next decade at least. So, but what can we offer? And so what were the challenges that we've seen to understand our ecosystems? You're probably familiar with this type of, of information, this type of relationships. You know, temperature is a strong driver for soil respiration fluxes, either soil respiration or ecosystem respiration. You see these nice functions when you deal with temperate uh, or northern ecosystems. Uh, unfortunately, in Mexico, these relationships well, not unfortunately, but this relationship might not uh, st stand as, as strong, which is very interesting for to understand our ecosystems. This slide that was prepared by Maru Gonzalez, that tiny shirt for me for this for me for this talk, depicts really nice some of the challenges that we're seeing across most of our ecosystems in Mexico, at least in the in the in the ones influenced that are more seasonal. So, for example, you see in the in the left side of the slides, you see like the dry season. So I was saying how the year is somewhat dry, temperature are somewhat high at very variable. And this is a time when the respiration fluxes are very low. Of course, there is low water. You can see the soil moisture in the, in the center panels is very low. So no water, no fluxes, but strong and high, high temperatures and variability. Then we have our rains. You know, our rains start, and you can see these strong changes on, on the temperatures. You see that the amplitude of the variation in the temperature is much slower, and there is a sudden drop on the temperatures. But this moisture that brings in brings these huge pulses of respiration. You can see this in the, in the right side of the, of the panel, around 8, 8, 165, 8, 8, 183, these large respiration pulses. This is, this is an example for a tropical dry forest, but you see these type of pulses across several ecosystems, shrublands and oak forests and these other ecosystems that we sample. So you see the lower temperature, less variable, strong fluxes and more moisture. And then you can see how the moisture fluctuates with these pulses grains and basically the, the respiratory fluxes follow those, uh, th those pulses and not necessarily the changes in, in temperature. So th this is an important feature that we can see not only for the tropical rainforest in Mexico, but for several other ecosystems that we understand is a challenge for modelers, right? We need to understand these, uh, these pools uh, and variable systems. And if you just start trying to find relations in these ecosystems, this example from Mario Gonzalez basically shows you, shows you everything. You try to do a temperature and respiration relationship and everything breaks down. You know, we might have a nearly response on the lower temperatures, then we reach a, a plateau and then a drop. So trying to find a function for this type of uh, of, uh, of, of behaviors is challenging. You know, I understand that our model colleagues yeah, suffer trying to, to depict these, these behaviors. So, and just the, these challenges for modeling also has implication, important implication for the eddy covariance community because think about gap filling. What type of models do we use commonly for gap filling? Temperature based models, Arrhenius types uh, functions, and flux partitioning, of course, highly dependent on the temperature features that all temperature responses that we see in our ecosystem. So, we, we, we are aware of that. There, Maru and our colleagues are working seriously on how to understand better, how to do better gap fillings and partitioning when we know that there are full relationships with the uh, temperature. So this is one thing that we can uh, get from what we've learned. So this has given us the motivation perhaps to, to start finding other ways to, 
to model or to try to understand our ecosystem. This is just an example that we had a few years ago for our dissertations that we basically were thinking, okay, it's hard to model these uh, ecosystems. Uh, their temperature functions are not at all strong, so no, they don't explain all the behaviors. Well, why, won't, why don't we start understanding the best we can the hydrology side of the of the ecosystem, right? So we took advantage of being friends of uh, Enrique Vivoni, for example, he's a strong group of hydro hydrologists, uh, modelers for hydrology. So we you now talking to them, inviting him to participate in the committee for Vivian Verdusco. We, we, we had this challenge in front of us. So how can we understand these pool driven systems or these highly seasonal ecosystems? Well, let's try to model and understand the ET flux and the and the soil water fluxes from the hydrological perspective, and then put the layer for the plant responses, and then try to connect with the with the carbon with the carbon response. This Vivian follow our main idea. I think it was a little. Uh, naive in the beginning we weren't sure what we were trying to do but i think we at the end get a very good result at least we learn a lot on how to approach these challenges that we have in, in our ecosystems of course being a, a hydrological model for example in the top panel we see the et part we got it pretty good you know these these models are often also validated with the, the et the et component so we get that part right but if you look at the, at the green and gray lines, for example, when we try to, to model the leaf area, which is one in this type of uh, modeling that we engage on, it was our key component because it's where is the carbon that we were going to put for the composition that's going to help us to explain the respiratory part of the, of the flux components. So for this, we have to dosify the, the leader fall, which is like the dotted lines here. So to come up with a good dosis of leader fall that will fall in the right moment, which that happens soon after the rain stops, later in the fall, and it all falls in two or three weeks. It was super complicated to, to, to tell a model to do that. We have to basically hand tune this part because if we were to use any type of leaf area approximation from satellite, from some of the methods that we have or what the actual model will tell us, it was impossible to dosify the leader fall at the right moment, which when we know it happens because we have the measurements for the leader fall. So we have to fine tune this part. If we had to tune something by hand was basically when the leader fall will drop is something that I think is still a strong challenge that we have to deal with for the Mexican ecosystems and for, I guess, trying to model any seasonal ecosystems. But we're hand tuning basically, at the, luckily we have good data for, uh, to, to first validate and then to, I mean, to calibrate and then model the, uh, and, uh, and validate the model. So I guess by fine tuning the litter fall, we were able to reproduce the net ecosystem production and we were able to have reasonable simulations for the for the ecosystem respiration I guess the simulation part will be the the red ones and the observations will be the blue ones and I guess we were trying to also do just like the autotropic uh, respiration on that part we have reasonable estimates at least we learn a lot in this process. We found where the, 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 the real challenges for this type of modeling and these highly seasonal and pulse driven ecosystems were. We hope we can move forward. I guess we now have good modelers and people that understand computers and better in the new generation of, uh, of the covariance people working in Mexlux. So this is probably where we're going to move two we have identified the challenges now that there are tools and models and this is a great opportunity to to communicate with the with the Ameriflux and the Flocknet community because it is really challenging to get at this at these processes but if we get to you know get better get a better grasp on how this uh, Mexican or highly seasonal ecosystem responds to to this very erratic uh, 
precipitation or very seasonal precipitation, we start we can start making predictions on how the ecosystem might behave with the tuning that we did, with the calibration we had for this hydrological modeling. For example, for GPP, this the black one will be the historic, basically the mean for the observational periods that we have. These are just three, three different uh, vegetation models that we use to simulate the response for CO2. Basically, this will be if we do, we increase the temperature, but we don't, do not increase CO2. So if we increase temperature, basically in the blue, in the orange, and the red, we have a decrease on GPP, respiration, ecosystem production, and the water use efficiency. But when we turn in the CO2, you no, know, I guess we did a, a strong scenario, uh, 9.5, I think it was. So we really want to see a, a a strong response when we turn on the the CO two everything basically back to where the average was. You see the blue, the orange, and the and the red. Basically everything came back to where the the historic was. And so so basically at, at least we learned, but perhaps not the most uh, outstanding finding, but at least it was nice to see that our model was able to reproduce what we would have expect. You know, a stress from temperature, and basically recovery with the CO two fertilization affecting this is for a for a subtropical shrubland the MX ray in the marine flux database. So I, again we learn quite a bit on this. We have these challenges in front of us, but we have uh, this you know new generation of scientists that are very really working very good with their computers and synthesizing the data and, and, and providing uh, assimilating the new tools that are coming up from the from the community to engage in these challenges. So I guess with that, I will take questions and stay here for a while for the for the rest of the workshop. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Mariko, for your presentation. Uh, so yeah, please, if you have questions, you can just ask them now or put them in the chat. Uh, I have one quick question, Mariko. So mm -hmm. so the model, did you use like a land surface model? Uh, like what type of model were you using? It's what it's called is T ribs. I guess is how they call the hydrologist. Is this little? They it do, it does like a little triangular form that are been connected among all of them. So basically, it's is very it's a very hydrology based model. So it's not necessarily a land land model. Okay. I guess is this. That's why the T rib. The T is for these teams. Is little features, just like little puzzle pieces that have been put together in the watersheds. I guess this is in a one dimensional, it's not it's not connected. It's just one, I know for the, for the tower one. Oh, but, yeah. but it reproduces very nice the soil moisture and the ET, which are key to understand the erratic pulses and the seasonality. Right, yeah, this is where you had like the letterfall thing, like for the phenology. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you, Enrico. And yeah, Thanks. I have some question about, so it seems like this Mexican ecosystem is really diverse and also dynamic. So I saw your map of where the uh, flux towers are located. Seems like a lot of towers are located in the, yeah. the uh, pink region where is desert, or is it correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's mostly, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the, the Yes, yeah, uh, because it's very semi-arid, arid, semi-arid. Semi mm. I guess the wettest one we got in that part is the tropical dry forest. It doesn't get to, I mean, the, in a wet year, you will get 800 millimeters, and that's about what you will get, at least for the northwestern part of the country. But places like La Paz, they only range 100 millimeters. Oh. In our tropical uh, problems, it will be, be raining at about 500 millimeters at the most. So I guess the majority of the of the sites, mm -hmm. at least the ones on the on the northern part, will be between the 300 to the 800 millimeter range. And I guess this is interesting because Hausen was showing and one of his yearly slides was showing where the domain, where the, the temperature rainfall sites for a many flux fell. So we will be basically contributing to the sites that are above the 25 degree annual temperature mean and below 500 millimeters of rainfall. So lower left. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. 
okay. Yeah, and, so... And, and, and they all very seasonal. They mostly all caducifolius. They drop their leaves, most of them. I guess the oaks will be the ones that might keep them, but most of them, if you walk on those uh, ranges in the dry season, you don't see any green. Yeah, so that was another very interesting point that you show us this temperature drop after the wet season started. So it seems like it's really hard to model. So like among this ecosystems in Mexico, which ecosystem do you think is the most interesting place and where, where it's hard to model, you know, like like what what it doesn't really follow the conventional understanding of like seasonal cycles. So which well, the, ecosystem, the, yeah, do you the, think definitely, it's more? Well, definitely the tool that I've been working the most, the tropical dry forest, of course. Okay, then, dry, yeah, tropical the, dry forest. And and then this the, the, the these shrublands, the one that I, where we did the modeling effort and the nice pictures that I show on the introductory slides. Mm -hmm. We call it a subtropical shrubland because tropical it's it's more like a uh, like a transitional shrubland because we do have shrublands that are very seric towards the coast where you only have like three hundred millimeters of rain, but these ones that are not even that high, perhaps in the one hundred to three hundred uh, meters in altitude, but is a transition. To the tropical dry forest that you would start seeing it beyond the after the 400 millimeters so this is not a it's not super seric it's very it's very caducifolly so that thing doesn't have any leaf in the dry season but when it rains it flushes as the, the pictures that you saw in the in the beginning and its productivity is quite high gpp is quite high it's very high for at least two months when we have rain, the, the system do look like a jungle. It will be like a very tropical system, wow. but it's, it's just a shrubland and the, the, the leaves are very labile. I mean, it's not that high. They will reach the tallest trees. There will probably be four or five meters, meters at the most. Our tower that is only nine meters high. So, so it's sort of like a unique system. And, 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 in, the, and in terms of of coverage is, is quite large because it's this whole transition between the coastal areas to the Sierras. It's like this belt of shrublands mm -hmm. that you find across, at least across the, the Pacific side is very common. And I guess in the Eastern side, it's also similar. Yeah, very interesting, diverse environment. And I think Hosan also mentioned, we certainly need more sites in <laughs> traffic or dry forest, so. Yeah, and, and what is and there, there is another complexity there because these tropical dry forests actually are, have very fertile soils for cattle grazing, like places in Sonora. You know, we're proud of our beef, cattle, mm -hmm. and everything. So the tropical dry forest is is like a prime ecosystem to cattle grazing. Right. And has very fertile soils. They're not very deep soils, but they're quite fertile. But so the problem is that they're very hard to, very easy to degrade. Locally, they, there are. Uh, rugged terrain so it's not that easy to do like intensive agriculture but we do have a lot of communities uh, living up in the sierras so these tropical dry forests they're not only seasonal pools driven but they're also highly managed so they're oh. for example if they do agriculture it's not going to be intensive agriculture so the communities will probably do agriculture for a few years and then we'll abandon it. And the succession there for the tropical reforest is very fast. So they abandon and in two or three years, there's like a bunch of pioneer species, shrubby pioneer species covering the land. And then, you know, the regeneration of the tropical dry forest will start. So you, you really need to, I mean, that's so far what we're doing here in Sonora. We have a, a tower in the yearly succession. We have a tower in the secondary succession and we have a tower in the, in the, in the old growth forest to, to see how those dynamics will change in the same ecosystem with different management mm -hmm. strategies. Wow. Intriguing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Enrico. You're welcome. Thank you, Enrico, for, for your talk. Uh, we're going to... We're going to be moving to our uh, third speaker. We're going to be with Dr. Stefan Mesger from NEON, uh, presenting about carbon due anchoring equitable climate solutions and directly measured greenhouse gas exchange. Thank you for being with us, being with us Dr. Stefan. Thank you, Teresa. Um, let me also check whether screen sharing and everything works as we 
anticipate it too. Um, okay. Here we go. I believe you can see the screen now? Yes, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, first of all, thanks to you, the organizer, for this awesome workshop and uh, for organizing this awesome workshop. And thanks to the attendees for staying on till the last talk. It's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Stefan Metzger, and I'm passionate about facilitating um, greenhouse gas net zero accountability across both what's known as technological climate solutions and nature-based climate solutions. My background is in atmospheric physics, and I serve as science lead for the 47 flux towers of the US National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON. Uh, how I think also mentioned that, mentioned here previously. I also invented flux mapping, which is a technology that we believe can be quite useful to move forward technology transfer of eddy coherent flux measurements to making them useful in industry practices for carbon management. Um, before I get started, um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors here, George Burba, with whom together I co-founded the Carbon U Community of Practice that we're going to hear about a bit more here. And then obviously the community itself, which is the author team here, uh, we're close to 200 members strong at this point, and there's, uh, there's just a tremendous amount that we learn from each other across the industry and, and academia divide. And I hope I can share some of this today. One thing I want to try is you don't have to see this bar up here all the time. I think there's a way to do this. Hide floating meeting controls. All right. All right, without much further ado, um, let's see how all this can come together um, using the, um, the, the carbon due vision um, as kind of a playbook. What inspired me to this particular talk is an article that a friend of mine moved, um, forwarded me in the White Journal about saving net zero bridging the knowledge gap between, on the one hand, what we can say scientifically, and on the other hand, what has so far been used in terms of evidence for carbon accounting, carbon management, and so forth. And at times, what's been used currently or in the past can seem very archaic coming from a high-tech academia perspective. So the question is really here how we can help with, with bridging that gap. And now let me take a step back and just provide a brief overview of how this type of carbon economy facilitating net zero is supposed to work. And so that's what I'm gonna attempt with this diagram here. Uh, there's essentially two branches. So on the left-hand branch, this is where we want to reduce current emissions, say smokestack emissions, for example, or emission from cars. Now, it's anticipated that there's always going to be a heart to reduce amount of residual emissions, uh, which are being MRV, which then for measured, reported, and verified. Um, and then the idea is to offset those through carbon trade. So say I still have a couple of tons of residual emissions, and uh, I can essentially pay for somebody else sequestering that amount of carbon that I emitted in a different place, different time, different uh, geography. And that connects us to this uh, right side branch here, the emission offsetting, where in the flux community, there's a lot of talk about nature-based climate solutions at, at this point. So the idea is here that there's current practices, so business as usual, and maybe there's ways how we can tweak, how we can improve uh, ecosystem management agriculture management, forest management, and so forth um, to facilitate additional sequestration. And this additional, this delta, that can essentially then yield the offset that is needed by the left-hand branch. Now, the issue that immediately happens is that there's a myriad of different ways how to quantify residual emissions. And there's another myriad of different ways how to quantify what this additional sequestration might be. 
regardless of that, regardless of this, this disconnect and really us unknowing whether a ton of carbon, a quote unquote ton of carbon on the left side equals the same amount of molecules as a quote unquote ton of carbon on the right hand side, um, these tons of carbons are being traded at this point. And uh, there is a, a lot of opportunity in that sense for greenwashing, which always makes it into the press. And I think we are exceptionally well positioned with Ediflux measurements to help out with that and to provide a benchmark across these two different branches. Now let's take a look at, at, at how something like this could look like. So this is the concept of our, our division of our carbon new community of practice to use what we have here in the left hand side, direct measurements of greenhouse gas exchange in and out of the atmosphere to anchor what's here on the very right hand side fair and equitable climate solutions uh, across nature-based climate solutions, technological climate solutions, and across both reduction of current emissions and removals. Now, the mission of the community itself is to bring together stakeholders across the entire spectrum of industry and academia. So if any of what you see here and throughout the talk resonates with you. In the final couple of slides, I'll briefly present our current activities that uh, you're more than welcome to sign up to and to join us. Um, and to move us forward here, I'll take a, we'll take a look at deep dive into two particular areas. Uh, first of all, to make sure we have a common foundation on what Ediflux can and cannot do for us here on the left-hand side, and then how mapping out these fluxes can actually help unlock some of what we see here on the right hand side. All right, let's get started. Direct greenhouse gas exchange measurements unlock cross realm climate solutions. Why is that so? Well, first of all, eddy flux measures in the very medium of interest. It measures air and how carbon and methane and nitrous oxide moves in and out of the air that we are concerned about. Um, with regard to radiative forcing. So it's not like we have to measure uh, tree diameters uh, in forests uh, and we then have to measure flue gas concentrations um, for, for different applications, not really sure how, how they would compare. Uh, we all know we use sonic anometers to measure wind. Gas analyzers measures greenhouse uh, gas concentrations. We combine those and they can obviously be used in towers and um, how San Enrico thanks for for um, providing us a great overview of those type of applications. Now they can also be used on aircraft, on vessels and on buoys, which are their own sub-communities. Um, and as we've heard, there's a lot of operational flux towers. At NEON, we only have 47, there's hundreds across the Americas and thousands worldwide. Now, what is so unique about Edicorans in comparison to what's the industry status quo for carbon management? Again, we measure in the very medium of concern in the air in which we want to net reduce greenhouse gas concentrations and we measure circular motions of, um, of air parcels. At the same time, we do measure the gas concentration and whether or not while air is moving up or down that has an elevated or reduced concentration, which essentially is a quadrant analysis, right? So you have an updraft, and if an updraft coincides with a high concentration, then you have an emission and so forth. So it's, in, in a way, it's fairly simple. <clears throat> it's fairly intuitive. So it's quite, quite literally greenhouse gas counting. Um, what moves up must come down at some point. <clears throat> All right, now from here, what is a strength of anti-covariance is this impartiality that I mentioned that um, over this set of proposed climate solutions that's kind of thrown on this plot here for each of, for example, here direct air capture DAC uh, and carbon capture underground in geology, um, you know, there's a very way to quantify that, then there's different ways to quantify how much carbon is being reduced in agriculture and for and so forth. So each little subset has their own quantification methodologies. Now, the beauty of Eddie covariance is it doesn't matter. We can look at it from a top down perspective. We can measure above all of these different type of climate solutions and treatments and provide an impartial perspective, um, a traveling standard, uh, a goal data set. 
And to put this in relation to the more, what's been established over the last 10, maybe 15 years is more traditional uh, kind of vocabulary of nature-based and technological. So in terms of this gradient chart, anything that is biotic, at least that's kind of the understanding that I developed over the last couple of years is oftentimes referred to as nature-based, where I'm not necessarily understanding why storage in geology, such as CCUS, is not nature-based, because rock is also part of nature, I guess. Um, but what really comes in here, in my mind, is a second dimension, which is whether or not um, we have very um, uh, intensive or less intensive human intervention. So obviously, if you need to drill down, a couple of hundred meters or, or kilometers into the bedrock, that, that is uh, pretty invasive to, to some extent uh, or perceived by some. Now that said, I think what we're really, <clears throat> really after this point is effective climate solutions. Um, and so I'm not necessarily seeing a divide between <clears throat> those established nomenclature, nature-based and technological. We really got to figure out what works and I believe Eddie Kranz can help with that. All right, now with that, we can take a look in how we can possibly unlock the, the power and the potential of edit covariance to inform uh, industrial scale carbon management. And that's where we take a look at direct flux mapping. So we've looked at the advantages and potential of edit covariance. Now there's also a very severe limitation, which is attribution. We are oftentimes uh, aware of that in terms of footprint modeling, source area modeling and whatnot, which typically means that we measure a combination of constantly changing surface features. And it would be really hard um, to now separate this data set here into um, attributing what a farmer say on the east side of the tower uh, should be awarded in terms of carbon credits versus somebody uh, who is having a forest to the west. And so this is where flux mapping is coming in. Instead of working in this plume type kind of perspective, to work in a georeference perspective with clear, with precise um, surface attribution. So what we oftentimes start with, it doesn't have to be 20 hertz, but fairly high frequency flux tower data, right? So we're getting tens of thousands of, of data points in say a typical half hourly averaging period. And even throughout this half hour, the, uh, the winds are constantly changing. And so typically with what we um, at Neon, at Ameriflex and so forth, the, the traditional data treatment is to essentially average this type of information and actually lose a lot of information. We're getting an, a mean flux that is fairly opaque, which is kind of difficult to, to attribute. It's kind of a stochastic function uh, that has a lot of tradition. It has revealed, unveiled um, a lot of, powered a lot of our understanding of how nature works these days. And it allowed us to parameterize all type of functions uh, in models and calibrate them and so forth. But still for this type of application that we're looking at, um, we, we're struggling with this ambiguous attribution. Now, the idea here is what about building on seven decades tradition with seven decades of innovation, use time frequency decomposition, dispersion modeling, physics guided AI to actually tap into these tens of thousands of raw high frequency observations and map them out every half hour getting a map. So you essentially, if you zoom in here, you get a 30 minute time series for each pixel. Now what you see is these hot spots and cold spots emerge and they actually change in time. They change in space, depending on what's going on the surface. So um, yes, this is the new kid on the block and there's only a couple dozen applications so far published. Um, it uses information transcription. So really tapping into the high frequency information instead of the high frequency variability instead of just averaging it out. Uh, and in doing so, it allows us unambiguous attribution. And with this additional, like literally sample size, tens of thousands of 30 minute data points that we can now use for remote sensing calibration uh, for, for all kinds of other applications, we increase our statistical power, not directly proportionally, but on the order of, uh, well, one to two orders of magnitude actually, with the assets that we already have, with the measurements that we already have. So this is then how it can look like. This is a study uh, that's actually a couple of years old, 
one of Angkor, uh, this ice tower here on the right hand side, which is being mapped out. You see the traditional flux footprint um, as it moves through the day. And then you see, uh, and this is 30 by 30 kilometers, just to put that in perspective. Um, you see how the surface flux forcing and, and attribution uh, actually changes throughout. You see these hot spots and cold spots move through the picture. So to kind of wrap this up, um, flux tower in a box, flux mapping data transcription is capable of integrating not just one, but multiple flux towers, if you happen to have multiple uh, towers or drones or remote sensing and so forth information. Uh, it's actually a 4D system. So it looks at the entire control volume and then it kind of squishes it down onto a map to simplify uh, downstream use. So it also looks at storage, for example, which you see, I think at some point in the sequence nicely here when convection kicks in in the morning, and then it kind of blasts through the control volume and you get this emission of uh, CO2 that's stored close to the surface. Um, what we also can do is observe, uh, observing system simulation experiments. So thinking about, hey, what is the best bang for the buck in terms of uh, I wanted to instrument uh, a certain research and development plot, say in agriculture and forest or in basic science, uh, we can figure out where geographically and temporally addition of, um, additional instrumentational assets can actually help complete the picture here. And we get greater uncertainty uh, from this information transcription. Here, a couple of real world case studies. This is something uh, we published, Susanne Wiese published uh, with us last year, uh, uh, a dairy farm flux tower. This is our usual flux tower perspective here on the left-hand side. And once we actually apply flux mapping, uh, you see that you're able to distinguish field scaled patterns. So these contour lines that you see here, flux mapping was never informed by that. That's superimposed. Those are like individual plots that are managed differently. And you see how um, the actual flux mapping does not match like 100%, but it does an extremely well job in, in capturing this, the, the effects of those different management practices. So it's, it's fairly precise. Now this year um, is hot off the press. It's actually la less than 12 hours old. I was still working on that uh, mid midnight tonight. Um, this is a, another real world case study, oil and gas um, emissions from an unmanned methane flux aircraft. And this is some, where we found something really interesting. So here's where you have uh, the property of a, of a large oil and gas provider. And here at the center point is where suspected emissions are. So that's where wellhead transformer stations are and whatnot. And yes, we do see the slightly elevated emissions, but they're doing a fairly good job in tightening their valves and, and all that. Um, now, if you actually zoom out, so now we look at two by two kilometer here, you see that on the regional scale, <clears throat> the oil and gas provider, or at least this facility in that case, is not the dominating source of methane, but it seems to be something else here. And when we actually uh, take a step further out, then we see that um, this year, the emission source to the right is, L is, um, is geographically coincides with wetland um, along a river and several lakes here. And uh, similar here, so we're getting into um, another, um, well, not riverbed, but there's another creek here with relatively large wetlands running there. And that's something I completely did not anticipate. I thought it's just going to blow the heck out of this oil and gas facility in terms of methane. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. And this just shows the power of having a methodology at hand, like edit covariance, that can actually work across these different sectors. Like you don't need to uh, count your valves and come up with a bottom up estimate of what that uh, methane emission should be. Um, but, and then compared with a different accounting approach for, for wetlands and for suburban areas, but here you can have it all in one map. So with that, um, we can work towards unified measurement reporting verification. We can have this flux mapping and can attribute it across different surfaces for both nature-based solutions, technological solutions, uh, with all kind of uh, different benefits uh, associated with it. Um, it's extensible, mitigates greenwashing, extensible um, to other assets such as water, possibly water scarcity in the future as well, and overall um, enable effective environmental and earth stewardship. So where does that leave us in terms of technology transfer? If we actually put up eddy covariance against other existing methodologies out there for 
carbon accounting or measurement reporting verification. Um, we are, yes, the most transparent methodology because we are literally counting molecules, but at the same time, we are just freaking expensive. So we are like pretty much here on the, on the right-hand side, annualized, annualized cost per kilometer screen, nobody's gonna pay for that. Now, if we actually do something like mapping out those fluxes and being able to attribute and characterize a much larger area, the annualized cost per kilometer square goes way down and becomes competitive with what is out there. Uh, and so essentially for the same price, you get a much better bang for your buck in terms of transparency, which the ideas over time will also reflect um, in the pricing of greenhouse gas certificates of different quality. Okay, so now we can put this all together. Um, the idea here is we have impartial measurements. We are actually squeezing all the information out of them that we can get with all the attribution that we can get. So we have very powerful ground truth to go into remote sensing and modeling. So essentially with the data foundation that we already have to squeeze 10 to 100 X of information out of that um, and address those calls of the remote sensing of the model community. Hey, we need more ground truth. Well, here you have more information. Lock the results in a public and transparent blockchain where any modifications um, would be visible and then, uh, and then distribute that information both through uh, APIs for power users, uh, but also to foster awareness on the neighborhood scale uh, through kind of mobile uh, handheld apps where you can see similar to weather apps today's, hey, how is my garden doing essentially? Or, or how is my, um, uh, my, my neighborhood uh, green areas working? What kind of work are they doing for me? Because I'm paying the water bill for those. All right. So this is where we started, right? We had our carbon economy and there was a kind of disconnect. Now, what we can do is to actually connect those two branches to benchmark them through an integrated measurement reporting verification that's applicable across both those branches. We attain clarity with that agency and through that ultimately accountability. And this is my last summary slide here in terms of activities. And really, if any of this resonates with you, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, there are various activities going on. So for example, we work with the Syngenta group, um, this type of emissions mapping for carbon sequestration and soil health monitoring in agriculture. I also showed an example for industry emissions detection uh, with uh, Black Swift technologies. They do some very fancy drones that measure fluxes from unmanned aircraft. Um, we are also submitted for, in case you're attending, I think Housen, you mentioned the uh, Ameriflux meeting later this year. We submitted for a breakout meeting there where we actually want to work together towards open example maps for industry and regulation. Uh, and then last but not least, there's less than 12 hours remaining to submit an abstract to AGU in case you're attending the fall meeting. We do have a session there as well. Uh, Carbon News organized a session there, flux measurements for real world impact. So um, check it out, B074, if that's of interest to you. If you still have an abstract to submit, uh, that might be a good fit for you. And last but not least, I think uh, two weeks ago, roughly, or maybe three weeks ago, the um, Greenhouse Gas Monitoring and Measurement Interagency Working Group that's appointed by the White House, they sent out another, the second now federal strategy uh, to advance a greenhouse gas emissions measurement monitoring system, this time for the agriculture and forest sectors. Now, and we just so happen to measure over forest, right? And measure in agriculture. Uh, interestingly, none of that is currently mentioned. Uh, in that type of plan or in that type of strategy. And we're trying to foster um, awareness that what Ediflux can bring to the table and how that can inform such a federal strategy. So if any of that, if you want to participate in that, anything else resonate with you, um, check us out at carbonview.org and uh, there's various ways to sign up and get involved. That's what I have for you in terms of slides. And I'm more than happy for any open Q&A, any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Seven, for, for your thoughts. It's very interesting. Uh, this, yeah, if anyone has questions, you can just like, ask them now, put them in the chat. Um, I have 
quick question. So how far are we from being able to monitor carbon on, on our phones? Like, are we there yet or uh, like the, so the, the end product, right? The, the API thing. It's being done already. Carbon oh, it's done already, so we can. Yeah, you can okay. look up. So there's, I mean, there's already various industry players who, you, who tap into Fluxnet data. Um, so if you want, you can check out Carbon Space, for example. They already have an app uh, that you can download on your phone, but it's subscription-based. Um, and so what they do is they use the Fluxnet database uh, to train various, um, a, a cascade, a hierarchy of remote sensing data, do cross-validation, and then you can get pixel-wise uh, emissions. I think if you, uh, or sequestration, I think if you actually go to their website, you can get a course view. Um, of their uh, of their product to just get kind of an impression uh, of what's being done there. Uh, now, obviously, the uncertainty because you know it's, it's similar to the Fluxcom product, so the uncertainty increases in areas between flux towers. So you have essentially two anchor points, and then you do a space for time uh, substitution, and that space for time substitution for these pixels in between is getting uh, less and less well constrained the further you're away uh, from the specific eucliomatic zone that a tower covers. Okay, yeah, thank you. Carbon Space, uh, you can check out Carbon Space, you can check out GATE, G-A-I-T. Uh, they're doing something similar. There's various consulting firms who are tapping into Ameriflux, Fluxnet, other network data um, to trying to validate current approaches for carbon measurement reporting verification. Yeah. They all struggle though with attribution because you can imagine you have a flux tower there and then you have your soil cores there. Now that flux tower, that wind direction always changes, mm -hmm. right? And so when do they actually match? And so that's, yeah, I think, where we can come in and where we can help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is one question from Uzan. Could you give some in intuition about how flux mapping is done? Do you use a prior flux map to get the unmixed flux map? Great question. Um, this flux mapping is a sequence of techniques. It starts fairly simple. It starts with your traditional flux measurement and footprint modeling, just that we are able to resolve our flux measurements of the atmospheric responses to surface emission or sequestration at a minute or second scale by using time frequency decomposition which means every half hour, we're not getting one flux from the tower, but we're getting 30 or 100 data points. And we're getting 30 or 100 corresponding footprints that change through time, even on the sub hourly time scale. And now we can combine them in a forward way, which has been done in literature, I think earliest by Amiro in the 80s or early 90s, um, by essentially multiplying your flux measurement here on the minute scale with the um, surface with your flux footprint influence weights. And then you get this uh, 30 times or 100 times in half an hour, uh, which is an inverse problem. So you can find an inverse solution to that. And so that is kind of the ma initial map that we start with. That's very coarse. It has a lot of artifacts in it. And then you can combine that stabilize it through additional feature layers from remote sensing, from maybe uh, you might have additional data points where you have a soil pit, where you have maybe a chamber measurements. Uh, and so you can stabilize the entire data integration system. Yeah, it's very interesting idea of like doing this very fine resolution um, mapping of carbon fluxes. Uh, yeah, so as Usan said, it's like a Lagrangian inversion model uh, approach. So basically, you're doing inversion using the flux um, measurement, yeah. is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're familiar with that, um, that's that's our starting point. It goes way further than that. So that's the that's kind of the initial like the base layer map that we that we start with, um, and then we can combine that with any type of additional observational assets that are out there. Now, the beauty of flux towers are that they have a lot shorter memory than concentration. For example, tall tower concentration measurements that are traditionally used for Lagrangian inversions mm. or tall tower 
concentration measurements that we are inverting, you have like regional continental scale memory because you're dealing with like all the background that's a background concentration. Yeah. Whereas for eddy flux, the background by definition is removed. You're working with the covariance, so you subtract the mean. And with that, what you're getting in terms of information is essentially the last ping or the last couple of pings uh, of your air parcel with a surface. And so that is much better constrained. It lends itself to a, a lot more precision uh, in spatial resolution at the ownership scale that's needed for, mm -hmm. um, for the type of applications that we're looking at to make it interesting and attractive for industry. Yeah, but as a trade-off, I think the flux towers like the um, coverage or footprint is pretty small compared to you know like just total tower measurements. So because of that, um, the coverage is like only several hundred meters or, so, or something. So then, then to use this information to understand the global carbon emissions, you probably need a lot of flux tower measurements then, because the footprint is really narrow. Yeah, which is what, what is what Fluxcom is doing, right? Calibrating remote sensing data with existing, mm. with thousands of existing flux towers around the globe. Um, and I think where flux mapping can come in is to essentially unmix the hotspots and cold spots. So you're getting more independent observations, how you can, can calibrate different surface properties um, with data that we already have in the pocket that's that's already sitting in our in our databases and essentially increasing the amplitude range of environmental phenomena that you that you can explain with with precision and accuracy but you're right the um, i absolutely agree the concentration the tall tower concentration measurements and the uh, flux measurements they are complementary they are not um, they're not competing against each other, at least in my mind. They cover very different scales and for continental scale accounting and kind of a sanity check, hey, if I do all this like, you know, bottom up summation, does that actually match what we see on continental and global scales? That's absolutely needed. That's like, you know, top down. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, you can't get the ownership scale resolution from this, uh, from this concentration measurement inversions. Like for that, you have to go down to, uh, to decameter scale resolution oftentimes. Yeah, I'm running inversion for methane, the carbon track of methane. And yeah, our yeah. resolution is really coarse because we are just doing the global inversion. Um, and it's already taking like three months for us to like do this like very like coarse resolution inversion. So as you mentioned, I agree that we need like this complementary data set to actually reduce, like increase the resolution scale. So yeah, okay. Yeah, and you know what would be really beautiful, I guess, is to um, to work towards a meta product where this bottom-up integration, like Fluxcom, uh, informed with mm. order or orders of more surface information through things like flux mapping, um, can then also be. And, and I think uh, Martin Martin Jung actually published something along those lines in intercomparison. Um, mm -hmm. one or two years back, uh, you know, into comparison to the inversion methods, the conservation version methods that you talked about. Now, um, maybe the next step could be instead of going from comparing them to fusing them. Yeah, merge. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Merging the bottom up and top down estimations. And... Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, it will give us a very clear picture or much clearer picture about tolerances. Yeah. Uh, again, scale transcendence is a, is a problem here. Like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah in definitely. terms of the attribution of the uncertainty that we see. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it'd be awesome yeah. to talk more about that if that's of interest to you. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, thank you, Stefan, for, for the talk. Thank you, Stefan, Hausen, and Enrico. Really, it was a was a great, uh, I think, uh, ending for our for our workshop. Uh, well, thank you, thank you everyone who uh, who participated in the workshop. I'll uh, just have a small announcement. We have a, uh, like a just a short survey. So if you'd like to to fill it out, like yeah, at the end. So uh, just to make sure, uh, I, I drop the the right link. Um, Yeah, thank you, uh, Stefan, for sending the the link for CarbonDew.
And yeah, I just dropped the, the survey if we would like to hear, I mean, to improve uh, and for our next workshops. And yeah, uh, thank you everyone. And thank you again for all our speakers and hope to see you in the annual meeting of MRI Flex or AGU. <laughs> Thanks for organizing and having us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.